Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saiko. Um, you, you have given an interesting overall geopolitical uh, picture of, 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 of how the Taliban came to power. And I, I'm sure you will raise a, a lot of questions. Um, just for the audience as well, you can in the chat, uh, write down your question and uh, also put down uh, to whom you're asking it. And I, I find it very interesting that you in your speech have basically stressed a lot on focusing on the root causes of why the, why the Taliban is in power and why they're doing what they're doing then on the consequences. Um, and I'm very pleased that you have not spoken as a diplomat. Uh, you have named and shamed uh, countries or regional actors, as you call them, for their role in getting Afghanistan where it is today. And I'm sure you will raise uh, a, few, a few questions uh, afterwards, especially you have been very critical of the foreign policy of Pakistan and the inter-services intelligence. I don't know many diplomats who would say that that clearly. Uh, so, so thank you for that. Um, and we'll, we'll of course come back to you uh, at the end of, uh, of, of, of everyone's speech to talk about the questions and answers and, and, and the issues you have raised. Uh, now I would actually move on to um, Dr. Bahar Jalali. As I, as I told you in the beginning, uh, she is one of the very few women who have been very, very vocal about Afghan culture and specific, uh, especially about Afghan attire, women attire, um, because uh, you're now online and um, from the prism of Af the Afghan Taliban, you wouldn't be a good Afghan or a good Muslim uh, the way you're dressed now. Uh, but, but you have explained and you have a picture in your profile as well, which explains what Afghan attire actually is. Um, so over to you, Madam, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Hureshi. And I would like to, uh, first of all, express my gratitude for the, one, uh, for the invitation to participate uh, amongst this, um, these distinguished speakers uh, 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 to you and to the European Foundation for South Asian Studies. And in addition, I want to convey my greetings to all the um, uh, uh, listeners who have joined in uh, via Zoom from wherever they are. Um, so uh, Ambassador Saikal um, very eloquently covered all the major local, regional, international political ramifications uh, regarding the Taliban and women's rights. Uh, what I'm going to be covering is three points. Uh, I'm a historian by training, and I'm currently teaching a history of Afghanistan course. Of course, it's a course I taught many years in Afghanistan for nearly a decade. And um, through that, I want to debunk some stereotypes. We live in a post-truth age where misinformation is an everyday reality. And sometimes the misinformation gets fact-checked and corrected, but often it doesn't. And this is extremely important in the current context of Afghanistan when you have the Taliban terrorist regime in power attacking fundamental human rights, women's rights, and uh, their kind of you know publicity campaign to kind of portray women's oppression as part of Afghan culture. That's extremely serious. So I'll be addressing that. Second point, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience of working in Afghanistan for nearly a decade, teaching and founding a gender studies program. Also through that, I want to uh, you know debunk some stereotypes regarding. Uh, women, uh, women's rights, Afghan identity. Uh, the campaign that I started uh, in September really was based upon, you know, for many years, I've been concerned that the Taliban really cannot be called an Afghan movement at all. This is a movement of refugee origins. Uh, most of the Taliban rank and file are people who never lived or experienced life in Afghanistan. So I personally have a problem with the Taliban being seen as an Afghan movement. So I'll talk about that. And then finally, I'm going to make a few recommendations uh, about why the Taliban are, you know, um, 
so, uh, you know, have been emboldened so much to issue these very draconian decrees, which are basically an affront to the rights that women have been given uh, under Islam, under, you know, international norms of human rights. Uh, and so I have, uh, you know, I'm going to take issue with how the Taliban have been normalized to a significant extent by the international community uh, and why that is also have, have emboldened them. So let me begin with a little bit history. Uh, a while ago, General Petraeus, David Petraeus, uh, you know, the prominent American general, uh, he was, of course, very much against the, the decision, uh, President Biden's decision to withdraw troops from Afghanistan. And one of the arguments that he made was like, when we, when we went into Afghanistan after 9-11, we gave the Afghans something they never had before. And I fell out of my seat because he's somebody I respect and admire greatly. He's a PhD from Princeton. He's a decorated general. Uh, and he was basically talking about democracy. Now, I'm a historian of 1960s Afghanistan. Um, when we talk about women's rights, democracies, there is historical precedent for this in Afghanistan uh, under the old regime. A hundred years ago, we had a king, King Amanullah, a very feminist king, who established the very first schools for girls in the early 1920s. His wife, Queen Saraya, was one of the first Afghan women to be seen in the West without a veil, uh, accompanying her husband and very much a partner in his uh, you know, efforts to emancipate women. By the 1960s, in 1964, Afghanistan was able to pass a pretty liberal secular constitution. In 1965, Afghan women were elected to parliament for the first time, four women in 1965. And in the 1960s, we had the first female Afghan cabinet minister, the minister of, uh, you know, uh, the minister of health, uh, Kubra Nurzai. Um, so 1963 to 1973 was a decade of democracy in Afghanistan. And, you know, you had a ruling elite um, that was pretty progressive. You know, these were people who were, a lot of the uh, prime ministers of that decade were uh, people who were educated in the West, but also educated in Islamic law. Uh, and so Afghanistan was slowly but steadily modernizing as a country. Um, and unfortunately, historiography on Afghanistan is relatively underdeveloped. So that makes it all the more easier for misinformation to spread. Of course, in 1978, the old regime fell. And ever since, you know, for the past 44 years, they really uh, has, Afghanistan hasn't really recovered from decades of conflict of varying, uh, you know, varying types of conflict, Soviet, Afghan war, civil war, Taliban 1.0, the 20 year war on terror, and of course, the return of the Taliban. Um, so when, when very prominent uh, military scholars like General Petraeus say that, you know, Afghanistan never really had these types of reforms, it's extremely important to fact check that and to debunk that. Another stereotype about Afghanistan is that it's a xenophobic country. I have a published article that you know that you know really tackles addresses the myth of Af Af the myth of you know Afghanistan xenophobia. The twentieth century up until nineteen seventy eight was a time of you know modernization in varying degrees. Um, so when Imran Khan, the prime minister of Pakistan, says, "You know something." Uh, women, girls not going to school as part of the Pashtun culture or part of the Afghan culture, you know, when somebody at his level says something like that in, a, in an age of information in the post-truth age, it's extremely important to counter that. Because as we know, missing, you know, a lot of people have no knowledge about Afghanistan. All they see is the Taliban and the country has been at war for decades. So it's very easy to spread all these types of misinformation, especially regarding women. Um, a few months ago, I decided to do something that I wasn't sure about, but I uploaded an image of my mother on her wedding day in 1969. My mother got married in 1969 in a mini, in a mini skirt. And, you know, I got all kinds of reactions to that. Some people said, oh, you were part of a privileged class. Who, who are you to lecture? And other people said, oh, this is, this is nice. So, you know, uh, I got mixed reactions, which is fine. But the point that I was trying to make with these images is number one, images are very powerful in how we counter misinformation. The point that I was trying to get across is that uh, there is historical precedent 
for Afghanistan as a pluralistic society. In 1969, when my mom got married, you know, there were women wearing, uh, you know, headscarves and there were women wearing skirts and nobody, and, and it didn't matter, right? They had that freedom. There was that tolerant, pluralistic, civic culture that did exist. What the Americans brought after 9-11 is not something completely foreign and new and alien to Afghan culture. There is historical precedent. What's happened is in four decades of war, you've had multiple waves of brain drains. You take a country that was just starting to modernize, right? And you it's been plagued by four decades of conflict, war, and uh, uh, massive waves of uh, br uh, brain drain. So the, the campaign, uh, to uh, you know, promote and safeguard Afghan identity is also a campaign to address the massive misinformation. Afghanistan is a xenophobic country. Afghanistan, where women's education was never really a thing, Though that type of misinformation just really um, uh, you know gives more ammunition to what the Taliban are trying to do and depriving women of the right to education, to work, uh, mobility. Uh, now they're saying that women can't go into parks. Um, so that's a bit about the history. Now let me switch gears and talk about my own experience from 2009 to 2017. Um, so of course I'm from a generation of Afghans, um, the last generation that was born in a peacetime Afghanistan. And I'm very grateful to be as old as I am because I saw a little bit, just a sliver of, of, of peaceful Afghanistan and today, the country that I was born in, the country that where I was a toddler, remember being a toddler, the country where I went to first grade in 1980 is a country I no longer recognize, right? It's like Afghanistan doesn't live in Afghanistan anymore because it's been so profoundly transformed by these multiple actors, uh, regional, international. Um, so when I returned to Afghanistan in 2009, I, I taught history at the American University of Afghanistan. There was a lot of hope, uh, especially for women's rights. At that time, women's rights in Afghanistan was a buzzword. It seemed like the entire international community was just you know, enthralled by the ability of Afghan women to reclaim their identity, reclaim their rights. It was an, basically an expedient tool to muster support in the West uh, for the war on terror, right? But now, uh, you know, and so there was a lot of hope and we felt, we Afghans felt that that was a genuine, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a genuine desire by the international community to help Afghan women restore their rights, reclaim their identity. And in those eight and a half years, I had the privilege of teaching some of the brightest students I've ever known. I'm currently teaching in the, you know, I've been teaching in the US for the past three years. But when I look back to my Afghan students, the female students, they were uh, really exemplary uh, in their capacity and their ambitions uh, and their creativity. Uh, uh, you know, uh, and a lot of them are now doing wonderful things. Uh, and uh, so it was a time of, of great hope. Um, and I, you know, uh, but what I noticed was that um, the involvement of the international community regarding women's rights uh, was at times very shallow. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was often sometimes just a form of political lip service. So in 2015, I, uh, you know, had an idea. I said, you know, I have a lot of students working on gender mainstreaming programs. I think it's important to actually offer a, a, you know, a program, an academic program in gender studies, because that would help institutionalize the idea of women's rights in Afghanistan. Um, gender studies in an academic context was a little bit less controversial than, than perhaps, you know, uh, doing it as a, you know, um, public policy campaign or, or, or in a, in a non-academic context. So that program actually was a very uh, positively received. There was a lot of support from the university. And I saw my students just really, really hungry for education, for uh, you know, higher advancement, for professional growth. And in 2016, our university was attacked by the Akani network, by the Taliban. I'm a survivor of a Taliban terror attack. I've seen their brutality up front. I saw one of the, the top student at uh, our university 
was unfortunately murdered uh, 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 by the Taliban. And I, I was at that point trying to help him get a scholarship to study in the United States. So for me, uh, you know, I'm gonna now get to uh, my um, final point, which is, uh, you know, based on, my, based on my experience as a historian of Afghanistan, based on my experience of working in Afghanistan for nearly a decade, and based upon what I'm seeing now, uh, my biggest concern regarding the Taliban and what they're trying to do in depriving Afghan women of their basic human rights is that they are being assisted to a significant extent by the normalization schemes of the international community. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, the Taliban were invited to the Antalya uh, Diplomacy Forum uh, in Turkey, and you had the, you know, the president of the UN General Assembly taking selfies with the uh, senior official of the Taliban referring to them as the foreign minister. That's, I mean, when, when you know, when uh, senior uh, if, uh, UN officials do something like that, they should be held accountable uh, for normalizing these terrorists. That's an affront to the uh, uh, rights of the people of Afghanistan. Michelle Bachelet, right, the, the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, in August when the Taliban returned to power, she said, Women's right is a fundamental red line. You know, she issued a warning to the Taliban, right? And then earlier this month, she met with the Taliban in Kabul. Now, all these verbal uh, warnings are really in vain. They're futile and they're hollow when at the same time, the Taliban are being uh, invited to high, high profile uh, 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 gatherings, taking selfies, being treated like VIPs. Um, and just normalized, you have British MPs saying, well, you know, we lost, we should be magnanimous in defeat and, you know, recognize the Taliban. So all of this normalization is just only emboldens the Taliban even further. And this is, of course, after the disastrous surrender deal of the Trump administration. I would not call that a peace deal. It was basically a surrender deal bypassed the Afghan government, regardless of what kind of government it was, by bypassing the Afghan government and uh, you know, you know, negotiating directly with the Taliban, well, that's another way of really emboldening them, empowering them. So I have just a few, uh, you know, I don't know if I should call them recommendations or pieces of advice, but the first one is the Taliban should not be treated, uh, the Taliban officials should not be treated as leaders in good global standing, although they have, they have not been recognized as a legitimate government of Afghanistan, in some ways they are being treated as such. They are de facto authorities, but they are in some ways being treated as de jure authorities. Um, you know, if, if you need to engage with them, yes, engage with them in Kabul or Doha, not in Antalya or Munich, uh, or London with photo ops and, you know, uh, uh, that raises their prestige and, and further emboldens their misguided theory that they won the war and they won hearts and minds. Second is speak out for those defending women's rights. Instead of normalizing the Taliban, normalize those brave Afghan women who are protesting against draconian Taliban decrees. They're the ones who should be invited to some of these uh, uh, you know, gatherings, talks on Afghanistan, why aren't they? And I'm not talking about these elite female politicians. I'm talking about these grassroots uh, protesters, you know? Uh, uh, third, fund education and other services without funding discrimination. I think uh, Ms. Sarah Wahidi, I read somewhere where she said that, you know, trying to create SMS type of distance education uh, uh, while the Taliban are trying to, you know, shut girls out of the classroom. If they're stuck at home, we live in the digital age. There must be other ways to try to find alternatives until, you know, the Taliban get their act together or we see, I don't know, an alternative government or something. Donors should fund groups working to defend women's rights, including alternative education options. Um, and also I think um, uh, it's important to address the humanitarian issue. Uh, uh, even, you know, uh, uh, even though uh, there's, uh, even though the Taliban are uh, committing these human rights violations, the Afghan, ordinary Afghans should not have to pay for that. 
Um, so uh, there must be mechanisms to kind of resurrect some of the foreign aid, uh, and of course, which has the and the, you know the the uh, cutting off of that foreign aid has been very very a significant factor in the humanitarian crisis. So, but of all these points that I've made, my biggest concern right now is the normalization of the Taliban. The Taliban have not changed at all, but the attitude of the international community has changed towards them significantly. And I don't see how you can, uh, you know, have any type of leverage with the Taliban and say, well, you need to let girls go to school when at the same time you're inviting them and, you know, propping them up uh, um, as basically a government, even though that has not officially happened. So uh, I will stop there. And then um, if there are any questions at the end, I'll be happy to address them. Thank you.